All right, so welcome everyone to our usual meeting for the CNCF uh, Research User Group. Um, today is May the 4th. There was uh, an initial idea to celebrate this by bringing um, Tim Hawking to, to tell us about the early Kubernetes war stories and uh, Star Wars. Uh, but uh, we have a even better topic with um, kind of the bridge between traditional SSH um, UI like environments and things like this and, and containerization and Kubernetes. So it's pretty exciting. This is something that uh, a lot of us have, have discussed in past meetings here as well. So we have Janos uh, that will tell us a lot about the project. And then we have Nikos from CERN um, giving us a concrete use case. So I'll pass the word. Um, you you start, Janos, I guess? Yes, I think I'll just screen share and then uh, Nikos can take over on his part. So here's awesome. the thing. Here's here's the thing though. So so it's not like Nikos is just using the project. He's a substantial contributor to the project. He has spent I don't know how many hours um, working on on containers SSH and the, on the code base. On a lot of the features have been contributed by Nikos himself. So. Uh, Absolutely credit where credit is due. And today's topic is building a science lab with container SSH, which is one of our main use cases. So um, what is container SSH? Here's the part where we would have the funny video, which we can't show you because there is no audio when I play video. But you can go to the website and you can uh, just watch the video there. Oops. At least that's what I thought. So back to the, the slides. So container SSH is an SSH server, but it's not an SSH server um, like you would expect when you install OpenSSH. It's an SSH server that doesn't create a shell on the server it runs on. Instead, it connects to an API. So it connects to Docker or it connects to Podman or Kubernetes and starts a container. And then the shell it creates is inside the container. Container SSH itself doesn't have to run in a container. It, you can, of course, you can run it in a container. Um, and the other important feature is that you configure it dynamically. So it's entirely built with this, uh, you could say, with webhooks in mind. So it's kind of like a cloud native SSH. You can configure it however you want. And there's a lot of flexibility in in what you can do with it. So we built a we built a honeypot with it. People have used it for for web hosting, for jump hosts, and and those kinds of things. And Nikos will explain a little more about the the lab use case. Um, the way it works is you have container SSH, and then the user connects to container SSH using their normal SSH client. So there's no specific client required, no special configuration or anything else. It's just their normal SSH client. And then we start a container, and the user lands in that container. When the user disconnects, then the container is destroyed, which is an important feature because you want to clean up after your users. And that's one of the, the problems that you typically have when you create a lab setup is that people leave stuff lying around or processes running and that kind of stuff. You don't have this problem with container SSH because container SSH destroys the container after the user is gone. And we'll see later that you still have the ability to save data. Now, if two use, separate users connect, they, of course, go into separate containers. Um, so they're nicely isolated from each other. If you place resource restrictions on the containers themselves, then um, the users are restricted to the resources that you give them. And the directories and mounted folders, et cetera, can be configured just as if you were to do a Docker run. And whatever Docker run supports, we support in container SSH. The same goes for, for Kubernetes. So if you do a kubectl run or a kubectl create pod, you can, whatever you can do there, you can do in container SSH as well. And as I said, this is all dynamic, so you can do it using webhooks. Now, if one user connects with two connections, the tricky part is that you land in two separate containers. So at currently, it works on a per connection basis. So every container is created for um, individual connection. And when the connection breaks, then the container is also removed. 
this is an important design constraint and we have opted to do this because uh, if we wanted to drop uh, one user with multiple connection in the same container then we would need to think about how to scale this if you wanted to run multiple copies of container ssh then you would have to think about how do i scale this how do i synchronize the cleanup of containers etc and that is something that we haven't done yet it's definitely a plan for the future, but at this time, one SSH connection lands in one container. Um, the way this whole setup works is that container SSH has webhooks, and there are two important webhooks from the original version, and Nikos will um, definitely talk about the massive amount of extensions he has done to the project. That's the auth and the config webhook. The auth webhook is responsible for authenticating the users. So take their password or take their SSH key and the auth webhook uh, can decide whether to let the user in or not. And then there's the config webhook, which gets the um, gets a call from container SSH and says, hey, here's this user. Is this, the user successfully authenticated. Um, and the config server has the option to return a partial configuration uh, with their Docker settings or, or Kubernetes settings or whatever else. And that's how the container is created. And of course, you can configure the container to mount volumes just as you would when you do Docker or kubectl run. So you can, for example, use an NFS server to have users access their own data and have a writable folder that they can um, access data from, but still the container is cleaned up so they can't leave stuff lying around elsewhere. They can't leave processes running, those kinds of things. So why would you use container SSH? Why wouldn't you use something else? Of course, you can build a lab environment with other tools, um, but with container SSH, it's incredibly easy to access. So you don't need your users to install any specific clients. If they are running Windows, they can just use the built-in client in, in Windows 10 now. So you don't even need to install uh, Putty or anything like that. You can just go and have your users SSH in and it will immediately work uh, off the bat. You can create resource constrained environments, which traditionally has been a bit of a problem, as well as the automatic cleanup, what users leave lying behind. And what's probably important more for the corporate world is that you can record a detailed audit log. That's important when you want to uh, make sure that you record everything that users do. So for example, if you let the developer access uh, a production system, you want to record all the commands that they type. This is something that is fairly difficult to achieve with traditional SSH servers. And last but not least, it's fully open source. So it's under the MIT Zero license. You can do pretty much whatever you want with the code base. Um, and yeah, so where can you get it? You can go to containerssh.io. We have a fairly extensive website. We have development documentation. Uh, we have a reference guide. We have starting tutorials. We have a funny little video. We have a few more guide videos. There's also a Slack link. So if you need any help or you want to discuss any potential use cases, then just drop in the Slack and say hi. And the source code is available on GitHub. And with that, I would like to hand over to Nikos. Thank you, Janos. Let me share my screen and Can you see my screen, hopefully? Yes, we can. Uh, OK, great. So I'm Nikos. I'm working with the Linux configuration team at CERN. Uh, for the past year, I've basically been investigating ways to containerize SSH. This is the project that I was hired for, and uh, containerization was not the only thing I tried, believe me. I the first, the first thing I tried was actually using OpenSSH and messing around with scripts on logging and all that, but this did not work at all for obvious reasons, which is it's quite clunky and the other features of SSH such as forwarding and all that does not work because it's going to exit at the, where the proxy is and not where the user is. Uh, at some point, we discovered container SSH and we found out that it basically fits right into our use case. But the downside was it did not support all the things we wanted to do. Uh, to give some background information on our use case, uh, at CERN we provide what's the what's called the LX Plus service. 
LX Plus is the Linux public login user service, which is basically exactly what it sounds like. It's a set of Linux machines with, that are, have open SSH access for, for all users and employees at CERN. Uh, this, uh, these machines contain a big variety of uh, pre-installed programs and uh, analysis tools, programming tools and all that, compilers and compilers. Uh, they also contain a set of uh, network file systems, three or four, uh, that are used for for user home directories, general data storage, and also for uh, for delivering software. Uh, generally, the, the main uses for the service, as I said, is writing and testing code. Also, it's used for submitting jobs on our computing grid and for general file for general file operations. Uh, another use case that emerged recently was that during the pandemic, it was also used as a general workstation for those working from home, and also as a network proxy into our into our office network. Uh, so, as I said, we're investigating to integrate this service with container SSH. Jan also, as well, mentioned that. We have we have made a lot of contributions to container SSH upstream, and more specifically, uh, container SSH with its uh, with its authentication webhooks did not really support the the Kerberos Kerberos protocol that we need. Uh, the SSH protocol has a specific a different way of authenticating if it's based on Kerberos, which is the GSS API protocol. Uh, with the current integration. Container SSH only supported password, public key, and public key. With uh, though it did have different backends, it did not support the GSS API protocol. We have we have now uh, written a native integration for that, and uh, you can test it out. The current status of the service at CERN is that we have set up a pilot, and we are now testing its productive rate, productive production readiness. So if you are at CERN, for example, you can now log into Container SSH and test what has already been set up. Another point to go through is why go through all this? Why containerize? Well, uh, privilege, privilege escalation vulnerabilities are quite common, especially with uh, especially with Linux. And more importantly, when you have a, a service like LX Plus, which is a public login, uh, these vulnerabilities become of way more importance as any uh, privilege escalation can result in the compromise of multiple users. Another another point is that there are a lot of shared resources on our LX Plus nodes. For example, the temporary directory and the network interface. Uh, for the temporary directory, for example, a lot, the most important thing that is stored there is the Kerberos credentials. So if a user manages to get the privilege escalation, or even actually just manages to log in as another user, and they know a user, they know and they know the node that the user is currently using, then they can someone else can basically steal their credentials. With, contain with container SSH and with the current setup that we are testing, every user gets their own temporary directory. So even if someone does manage to log in, even actually, even if for some reason someone steals the user's password and they manage to log in, they do not have any credentials on the container. The container is just an empty cell. Uh, additionally, the second important point is the network interfaces. When uh, I'm sure when you're developing, you have a lot of you you have seen that you have a lot of uh, development servers. You have language servers to provide the completion and linting. You also have debuggers, which also provide the server. And a lot of these don't really have authentication, and many haven't even considered the untrusted the, the haven't even considered the threat model of having someone untrusted that is able to connect to it. They, are, they usually assume they are behind the firewall, which in a shared service, this is not the case. And uh, last but not least, first share is quite problematic. Linux has C groups and it does have some interesting things to manage uh, resource users between users, but it's not really the best. Uh, a lot of times when a node is overloaded, we see a lot of times when a node is overloaded, it crashes and we have to move user, users around and it gets quite messy. Uh, Moving to containers, Docker and Podman, for example, have really good, uh, really good options for managing resources. We can uh, we can limit exactly how much memory each user is supposed to is supposed to use, limit how much CPU, and even how much network uh, network bandwidth. And all of that we can do it on a per user basis. So 
the, the dynamic configuration of container SSH allows us to have different li limits depending on the user or group or their needs. Uh, finally, uh, this, this was basically the presentation of the use case. I'm now going to share to you the extension that was made to container states to allow authentication via Kerberos. Uh, this is basically in case your organization is running the same, the same, you, in case your organization also depends on Kerberos, uh, it would be, yep. Uh, also one thing, I, wanted to mention and I forgot is that the reason we did all this and extended container state to Kerberos is that CERN depends, depends on Kerberos authentication a lot and especially in LX Plus. Uh, the biggest use case is that users are used to the passwordless authentication, uh, which is a big convenience. And we weren't really willing to give that up. The second point is that Kerberos is used to authenticate users to their remote file system. So as soon as they log in, they need access to their home directories. Without that access, a lot of our setup scripts do not work. And that brings a lot of other issues. So having the user be, authentic, be able to authenticate to a third party service as soon as, as soon as the login is successful is a vital, is of critical importance to us. Uh, to continue on with uh, how the authentication flow works here, Kerberos. Basically, when a user connects to container SSH via the, via the Kerberos protocol, uh, container SSH, when setting it up, needs to be provided with a KitHub. That KitHub is the cryptographic service key of container SSH. So when a user connects, they provide their ticket for container SSH. Container SSH verifies that ticket. And as soon as it does that, it knows that the connection is genuine and that the user who is authenticating is who they say they are. So we have the username of the user. After that, uh, Condensus H continues with its webhook, webhook flow as Janos described earlier. Uh, the difference here is that instead of an auth authentication webhook, we do an authorization. We send the username of the user and we expect back uh, if this user is allowed to log in or or he isn't. In our case, this uh, in our case at CERN, this checks, for example, our user database. It ensures that the user is registered, and he, and it also ensures that the, the user is authorized to use the service. You need to be in a specific group to be able to log in to the Alex Plus service. Finally, there's also the configuration section, which basically returns a standard template for the container, along with a few with a few customizations. For example. Uh, when the authorization server fetches back the user, it also it also keeps like the user's preferred cell and the user's UID as long as any user's groups. These groups are then passed to the configuration and included in the container. So the users so inside the container, the user has their own cell and their own UID and group ID, the same as any other standard Linux system. The next most important step is that before container SSH hands over access to the user, they write the ticket, the Kerberos ticket, into the container. This ticket is placed in the slash temp directory by default, but it's configurable. Uh, this, ticket, uh, this ticket is then used to authenticate the user to any third party service that is necessary. For our, for our use case, it's uh, remote file systems. And after that's done, the the user cell is executed and the user gains, con gains access to the container as usual. And to note that this is all transparent to the user, the user has no idea that all this process has taken place. And the login time in my experience is about the same as container SSH. So there's no really any overhead. So this was, this was what I had to present for now. I understand Janos has prepared a nice demo for us. And I left quite a bit of time as well, so we can discuss uh, discuss the use case, discuss container SSH as well, and let me know what you think. Yeah, do, do we do the demo now, or you want to take a couple of questions? Or uh, if, the, if there are any questions, we're happy to take them. Um, yeah, maybe, I, maybe we give like two or three yeah. minutes for questions before the yes, demo. Yes, let's already. do that. Any Anyone wants to step in? I, th I think we shocked everyone. I can I can I can kick start and maybe someone will jump in. I had a, a question regarding you, you explained because just now that the Kerberos credential is written into the container environment. Yes. 
uh, is there a process for renewal or are the users supposed to then reissue uh, credential on expiration like you, the corpus credential like one day the, there's no renewal, but you can uh, you can quite easily set up a task that is started in the container. So like every two hours, renew the ticket. This is and, definitely possible. And this would be, you would have to do this for every single instance, or it would come with your profile. No, it, uh, you would uh, you would set this up in the. If, uh, what, how I would do is is I would set it up as a cell wrapper. So as soon as the the user cell start. Uh, say add a, start the task to re automatically renew the tickets. Okay. Actually, in in our current system, what we use is basically a system D unit. So this would be quite the same. There is there is also the ability. So so what we do is we have an idle command that runs as the first process. So you you could configure this idle command as well to to perform that renewal whenever necessary. The only important consideration is that the idle command needs to stop whenever it gets a a, a sick term. So it needs to stop properly because the idle command is the first process that runs in the container. Because in SSH, what you can do is you can open one SSH connection and then have multiple uh channels within and that's what nikos implemented as well for for tcp forwarding and things like that but you could theoretically also open multiple shells and that's why the first process running in the container is always the idle command and this idle command is just sitting there and doing nothing you can reuse that to um to to run time tasks like that so is this like you each user would be able to specify their own command theoretically and do you actually allow this nikos uh, this is this is actually from the configuration server. The users cannot, obviously, for security reasons. But you can you can quite easily have a system where the users enter like their command on a portal, and this is entered into a database, and the configuration server pulls that. For example, you can do that in LDAP. You can have a a field there. Okay, I have another question before opening to others, which was just for for the image that is running the container, is this uh, a curated image by the service or is this also customizable by the user? Uh, I can take that as well. The image, you can have any container image you want. The only requirement is that if you want certain features of containers to work, for example, writing the GitHub or port forwarding that we're working on, you need to have an agent, a specific binary placed in the container. Other than that, there are no restrictions on what image you can run. Yeah, realistically, right now, you pretty much can't really use container SSH unless you just want the really basic SSH functions without the agent. So you should really, really add add the agent. And I, I think that's something that we might consider actually dropping support for it to run without the agent. OK, cool. Thanks. Other questions, comments, feelings? Uh, in the meantime, so so one of the things about uh, about the current version that Nikos is working on, so this is a this is a working prototype. We haven't released this as a fixed version yet. We're still working on a few uh, things there. And what's probably also interesting to mention is that we're working on an OAuth integration. So if you're not if you're not jumping into into the Kerberos world, what you can also do, and we have worked with SSH client vendors as well, um, is basically have a prompt that says, hey, click this link. You click the link, go through the OAuth flow, and then it goes back, and then you're logged into SSH. So that's something that's coming in the next version as well. So keep uh, keep an eye on for container SSH version 0 0.5. Yeah, I was just checking this chat, and Benjamin was asking exactly that, if it's possible to do that. So I see Arne also had a question, no mic. So it says, the renewal is limited to the Kerberos ticket renewal time. It will not work beyond. Yes, that's, cor that's correct. Uh, the, with the Kerberos, we just place the ticket that is given to us in the container. And after the renewal time, either the user has to reconnect to give us a new ticket or renew it himself. Yeah, I guess they could just gain it from inside the container again. Yeah. Right, Nathan, I don't know if you have a mic, so go ahead if you have. Otherwise, I can ask for you. Um, you saw the shoes with the mic, he says. OK, so uh, does the, the question is, does the agent run as the user? And can we use pre-trace to have fun with the agent? <laughs> That's a fun question. Yes, the agent does run as the user. And yes, you can fun, have fun with the agent, but it, will, it really does not do much. Like for the port forwarding, 
all the agent does is basically tell Pandaria states new connection came in. Uh, here's the details of the connection, and Pandaria states just forwards that to the client. So you can have as much fun as you could with a standard SSH. It does not give you anything. What you what you can do. So so one of the the things is that um, for another demo, um, I hacked together. Uh, a, a little bit of a modification of the audit log protocol. And what I did for the for the audience is, hey, here's an SSH server, SSH into that. And then I opened the website and on the website, you could in real time see what they're typing. So um, if, if that's the, the kind of fun you're into, then uh, I can definitely just message me after. <laughs> I can give you the, the source code for the patch um, to make that happen. Hopefully that's gone. So that's that's one of the things, Nikos. Maybe I don't know if you you kept track of that. So that's one of the things we're using um, a storage format called Cbor um, for for binary uh, storage of the audit logs. And they are now working. So the 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 people who are implementing the Cbor library are now working on implementing the patch that we need for for uh, live decoding of of Cbor messages uh, into the library. So that's hopefully going to be. Um, Fairly interesting. Sounds great. All right, that was pretty lively. For a I, of yeah, you, you want to continue? Ask because I also have a question, but we, I can yeah. also do it after the demo. Go for it. Go for it. Comments, go. Yeah. yeah, no, I think that's really cool. I, I was just wondering, I mean, I was looking into this in the context of, you know, we call it a bit like analysis facilities. Like, if you want to, like, traditionally, people would always SSH to their machines and then, um, well, basically only have terminal access, but but nowadays uh, more, more often people actually uh, want the Jupyter notebook, so then they would have a web page instead. And like combining these two, and uh, I mean from the discussion I get, is it uh, possible? It would be really cool if you can basically use your terminal and then an SSH, and then for instance also use your local um, text editor for changes. But then on, at the same time, you basically have the browser where you can, for instance, then execute your your Jupyter notebook or something like that. So is, is that something? that's in principle possible or the, you've even tried um we have so so there as a, so if you have your either you go with with the single node setup where you say okay this user is living on that that node which can be a vm or it can be a physical physical machine and then you're on the jupyter notebook on there and then you share a directory between between the the jupyter notebook container and the container that the user is editing in uh, or you use something like an like an nfs server where you can uh, just give them their home directory the home directory is mounted in the jupyter notebook container and it's also mounted in in container ssh and then the jupyter notebook container would obviously keep running the container ssh containers are just popping up as the user is sshing in and of course, you can use uh, SFTP as well, as long as you have an SFTP binary inside the um, the container. So if you have that, then you can, for example, use an if you have a development environment that does SFTP, I don't know VS Code, etc. Then then you can configure that to basically work remotely using container SSH. Um, we tried that; that's actually works pretty well as well. Okay, oh, that's very cool. Thanks. Awesome. Uh, there's one more. I think we'll take the last one and then we do the demo, which is from Timothy about persistence. Uh, do you want to ask, Timothy? I see he has a mic represented, but maybe he also doesn't work. All right. Yeah, um, I couldn't, I couldn't okay. find the window. It got hidden. Um, multitasking here. There you go. Um, yeah, you mentioned that uh, you have persistent storage and you can share storage. Is, did I hear that correctly? You want to, is that just a simply, you know, a shared volume or? So I don't know how, 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 how Nikos does it in LX Plus, but um, basically since when you do a, a pod, in Kubernetes, you can specify, OK, mount this volume. The volume claim itself, so let's say you wanted to dynamically set up a volume claim, you would have to do that from the config server. So you would have to talk to Kubernetes and say, please make a volume claim. And then you would have to use that volume claim in the pod uh, in the pod spec. But whatever you can do in the Kubernetes pod spec, you can, you can pass back from the config server. So you can dynamically say, OK, use this volume claim, use that volume claim. So is it the typical use where you're just simply mounting some shared global shared home directory into the container? Yes. So it looks like a like you're sitting on a cluster, like a, a typical 
uh, yeah. HPC cluster. There is there is nothing there is nothing specific that container SSH does specific to volumes. Uh, we just simply pull in the config structure of the backend, whatever the backend is. By the way, so little side note, there is an SSH proxy backend as well. So if you're not into containers, you can just use it as a proxy for for auditing. But we don't do anything with the volumes. We just whatever the config server does with it, whatever the config server says, we just mount it. Thank. You. All right. So I think we can go for the demo. But maybe Nikos also can add to, to this answer that at CERN we actually have these kind of shared file systems. We actually have more yeah. than one. Yeah, we do. We have AFS and refile system, which is actually this one was quite complicated to get it working. I actually have two uh, two deployments of containers since CERN. Wasn't one is based on Kubernetes and one is based on plain Linux machines. Uh, on the Kubernetes, basically both of these, uh, we have the AFS, which is which requires a kernel module, and then it works as a network file system. So for each node, we mount the kernel module, and for each container, we, then we just say mount from the slash AFS from the host into the container. So basically an NFS, but in the kernel space, kind of. Yeah, but it's. I think the complement to that is that it's not related to volumes. It's just uh, something yes, it's, that is basically it's a, a, a bind mount to whatever is set up on the node itself. So yes, it's, it's a bind mount, or it can be any NFS NFS server anywhere. It doesn't matter. For some of the systems, we are able to get around with uh, uh, running the module, the kernel module itself, as a container. But for others, like AFS is a bit more tricky because of uh, the libraries not supporting re recent features in the kernel. Um, I'd like to reflect on, on Benjamin's comment regarding SSH Swift, SS Swifty, or I don't know how you pronounce that. So um, as far as creating a web client is concerned, we looked uh, into that briefly. It's it's one of uh, on the things on the roadmap. And the reason why it's on the roadmap is because um, the, the way if you have to set up an external web interface for people to use, then it's fairly complex to set up because you need to tunnel through a WebSocket connection and then make an SSH connection out of it. Um, in which case you lose things that you could use like Kerberos because the browser can in, uh, authenticate via Kerberos as well. So the plan is actually to build in support for a, a web client. It's a, it's a bit of a tall order, so I, I don't know when that's going to happen. But it would be very nice if you could natively integrate Kerberos support into container SSH using a web terminal. Um, in which case you could just go and uh, and basically open a browser and then you have your SSH and it, it just works and you're logged in. You can go uh, start typing on that. Um, so you do for normally for for SSH uh, for web SSH things you need some sort of a server which is going to be either Python or Go or something like that. Um, and and I think that's a bit of an overhead to set up, especially if you want the more advanced features. It's probably not going to work. So we're gonna work in the future depending on on time because at, at this time this is on my side still a little bit of a side project uh, we're gonna work to make sure that we have a, a web-based solution for that as well um i think i just jump into the demo real quick um so what you're gonna see here is a modified version of the quick start example so what i did here is Hold on, there we go. So here's the quick start example. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna do Docker Compose up um, to start a bunch of containers. And you can see I have debug logging because I can. Um, this is a fairly extensive log, so you might wanna turn this down for, for production. And then I can do SSH foo at localhost minus P2222. And this is running in the Honeypot configuration. So I can use any user to log in. It's going to let you in without a password, with any key, et cetera. And the interesting part is, as I said, we're dropping in a container. So, oh, actually, I didn't. Oh, I didn't add an if config. But if, if I added an if config to this image, then you would see that there is no network interface running here. There are, apart from the, the container SSH agent, which is running, as I said, as PID number one, there is nothing else running in this container. You're, you're completely isolated, and you can set up the file system permissions as you desire. You can set a, 
a read-only or a root file system, etc. And you can see I even took the the username from the SSH connections I logged in as foo, and I took it in and and emulated that for the uh, for for the user. So it looks like hey, I'm on a really uh, I, I'm on some machine that's do, do, doing some Bitcoin mining. So if you're going into research um, and and trying to research SSH attack patterns, then um, then this is a fairly good way to do it because you can actually simulate a real environment. If you want some more hardening, you could look into something like Firecracker VM, which actually runs VMs instead of containers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And as far as the the entire setup is concerned, what we have is um, the config file. So the config file is uh, is is really well documented. We have this little banner. You could add your privacy disclaimer or whatever you want to add there, whatever you're required. And then you have the two uh, webhooks. In this case, I have two separate containers running. One is the auth config server. This is the default. We, we supply a basic auth config server that you can use for testing. And I created a separate config server to make sure that the username matches. I selected the backend Docker in my case, and then I have a whole bunch of settings that, that reduce my exposure to potential attackers. This is really well documented. So we have a guide for setting up a honeypot, um, and these settings are all documented in that guide. We have uh, additional to that, we have some hardening guides for both Kubernetes and Docker itself. And that's it. So basically, there's the config file. Um, and then you have the Docker Compose file, which which fires up the containers. Uh, what it does, I have the guest image just for the convenience of building it. I have container SSH itself, which I'm exposing on port 2222. And I have a bunch of volumes, which is basically just the SSH host key mounted in, the config file mounted in. And I'm mounting in the Docker socket so it can talk to the Docker um, Docker daemon. And then I have my two other little helper webhooks there. And then we have, of course, libraries in, in Go to help you write a webhook server. Or you can just take the, um, the description and write your own. It's basically a JSON that you need to return. One note, the current uh, stable version of container SSH, we publish an OP and API doc for these. The problem is it's currently, unfortunately, broken. It's going to get fixed in the next version. So you will have an open API doc so you can generate the, ser uh, the server libraries in any language that you desire. And that's it for the demo. Very good. I think we can go back to comments and questions. I, I will start again. I had one which was uh, Nikos mentioned the UID GUID, GID coming from like a metadata service like LDAP or something. In in practice, is the you, you're passing this to Kubernetes, I guess, uh, but there's no usage of uh, like user namespaces or anything like this, I guess. Uh, for for Kubernetes specifically, there's no support for user namespace, sadly. <laughs> But uh, for Alex, for the other service, we are we are looking into enabling users namespaces as well. But currently, it's using the users as it as it gets from LDAP. Yes. Okay. Other questions? Um, Ricardo, you mentioned something about uh, kubectl debug. Uh, no, it was just because you were saying you didn't have the IP command available. So oh, this right. But this is a this is a Docker setup. This is not a Kubernetes setup. Yeah, that's why that's why I said yeah. with Kate because it, it's a constant pain that the minimal images don't have these tools. But uh, I was just putting it there because these ephemeral containers and kubectl yeah. debug are like incredibly that's, helpful for this kind of thing. Yeah, so that's actually something that we could look into implementing in container SSH that we can start an ephemeral container in an existing pod. To back to the question of uh, running Jupyter Notebook, we could, for example, run Jupyter Notebook and then run an ephemeral container for the purposes of SSH access. But that's something we, we currently haven't implemented. Um, if you're if you're uh, if you're having fun with with Go development, then uh, then I I have do I have the project for you? Awesome. Let me check here the chat. Feel free to pop in. Well, people think I have two more comments. First one is the submission, like we, we didn't even have Cook Convalencia yet, but the submission for North America is already open. So I was, I was going to suggest, please submit a talk about this project. I think it would be amazing. And I think uh, it would be 
considered. The second one is I was checking the GitHub page and you seem to have quite a lot of users, but uh, maybe not so many contributors yet. So did you consider donating or submitting this project to something like the CNCF, for example? Um, yes, so so the, the thing about the users is that we don't know most of our users because we don't do any sort of tracking or anything like that. The only number that we have is 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 the number of container polls and that's that's a, that's a fairly large number so we had over the last year i think over a hundred thousand uh, guest image polls and several thousand installations um we did consider so so the thing about container ssh is it's very early in its life and nikos is so there are a few uh we are right now four core maintainers um and nikos is Next to me is is one of the people who write the most Go code. We have one other friend of mine who is working on on the web uh, web related stuff. So there is now configurator for for container SSH etc. And uh, my wife Sanya, who is uh, very avidly looking at her her own project right now, is uh, is is working with a lot of the the organizational stuff and also did a fair number of contributions. The problem that we're we're having right now and why we haven't done this yet is because in order to to donate to the CNCF, we would kind of have to think about, okay, what's the governance model? And right now the gov governance model is we agree on something and that's that. I think you got muted somehow. Yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, so, so we'd have to think about the governance model to to make that happen. And I believe, for in order to donate it to the CNCF, then we'd also have to change to the Apache two license. So that's the that's something that I read was a requirement uh, in order to submit it, which is not a problem because we are MIT zero, which allows us to do that. Um, but uh, as I said, this is just an organizational matter. We'd have to. We'd have to go and uh, and actually do the legwork. Right now, we're focusing on on actually getting the next release done, and yeah. then we can see where we can take this project in the future. Because you're right, it would actually be a good fit for the CNCF. So actually, you don't need the governance model for the sandbox. You will need it later. Uh, the MIT license, I think, it's compatible because it's copyleft, so it should be fine. Uh, if you need help with this, ping me as well. Thank you. That would that would be actually good. Yep. Yeah. Okay. There's a question from Jonathan. Uh, does Jonathan have mic issues? I don't remember. I do. I just wanted to ask if you're you're aware of uh, HP Craze UAIs that is available under their um, CSM stack management stack. So does their sort of answer to what I guess container SSH is providing? So it is a containerized login environment that folks can directly SSH connect to um, and run run there. It, it it sort of replaces just having a a static login for end users. Yeah, I'm not a I wasn't aware of this project. What I, I am aware, I don't know, Nikos, you, maybe you can speak if you have any additional info to add. What I am aware of is that the, there is an SSH server called Teleport Pro, but what they're doing in order to make their um, two-factor authentication and, and, and web-based login flows possible is they have an extra client that you need to install. Um, and so I don't know, I don't know about this project, so I'll, I guess I'll have to take a look at it. So yes, the answer is no, I'm, I wasn't aware. Nikos, I don't know if you have any, anything else. No, no I was not aware of this project either. All right, I guess it's something you can follow up as well after. Checking here if there's any more question. If not, then thanks a lot. This was pretty awesome. Nice, uh, nice overview and demo. Lots of questions. So I guess uh, maybe maybe one thing we can do is uh, yeah, we all have the pointers now. So if people try it, because yeah, Nikos gave it a go here at CERN. If other people try it, it'd be nice also to hear about it. 
if you if you need if you need help setting up the version that Nikos has been working on, I think then the best way to do that is to pop into the containers as it's Slack, and we can we can help you get started there because there are fair, there are still a few patches that are unmerged and that we need to review and make sure that they're stable before we can merge them into the main branch. I usually hang out the Slack the Slack channel a lot, so if you oops um, sorry, so if you join that, I will be there and I can help you. Um, and we're both on the uh, the CNCF research user group Slack as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a question from Alex. Alex, do you want to go for it? Yeah. I just. Um, I, I think there are a couple of companies who do this with proprietary kind of uh, options. Just wondered if you could talk about how uh, how things compare. I think like Teleport is a uh, an alternative. Doing something yes. very similar. Um, you know, a lot of the same things pop up, like audit logs, and I don't know, a lot of the same features. Is there a a way for me to compare one to the other? How should I think about it? Uh, we didn't put together a feature by feature comparison table, and the reason for that is that it would be very hard to keep up to date, especially since we don't have the funds to continually try oh, and buy. The... I, sorry, I, I didn't mean to like. Yeah, you, give me a table. I was just like, yeah. What, what are what are some of the sort of comparisons? Uh, right. Yeah. So, so, so the, the the way that you can think about it is, I think so. Teleport is actually open source. So if you want to go, you can try Teleport today. It's they they make it open source. The business model of these companies when they sell you a solution like this is usually access control. So mm -hmm. the way that this usually works is, is okay, you want to protect your company network. You want to have people come in. Then um, you can use our solution, whatever that is, if they use a custom client, or you can use Teleport's companion to your regular SSH client, et cetera, to access the network. Um, I believe HashiCorp also has some sort of a, a gateway solution where you can go into your company network and they give you some sort of a, an access control of what can be uh, accessed. The, the difference between container SSH and these projects is that container SSH is relatively unopinionated. I'm saying relatively because we still require you to use a guest agent if you use the um, the container backends. If you if you use the SSH proxy, then you can do whatever you want behind it. So you can just pipe it to the to the next SSH server and it will just continue working. But we don't give you a business a model of okay, this is what we think you should do with it. We just say here's the tool, here's you can start containers with it, you can proxy with it, it has audit logging. And then you could go into details of, of comparing, okay, how detailed are those audit logs? Because we're literally logging everything if you wanted to. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then you could decode the SFTP streams and, and extract the files and whatnot. But uh, if you build a lab environment, if you build a honeypot, if you build some sort of something that we didn't even think about, you can do it with, with container SSH because it's a building block, whereas the commercial solutions are usually geared towards a specific audience of, of this is what you should do with it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, that helps. All right, there's a couple of links also posted by Panjana and Jonathan on some possibilities as well in this area. So I guess people want to check them out, go for it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, yeah, thanks again, Nikos and Janos, for, for the nice presentation. I'm sure Thank that you will come back. To the group it's a thing to, we we've seen it in other presentations already so i'm sure it will come back and we can we can get an update later uh regarding other stuff um so the first thing i would mention is that we won't have the meeting in two weeks because it's cook so uh, we'll skip that one next one will be june 1st uh we, we are now setting up the agenda for the rest of the year, like we did in January for or December for the first half. So if you have uh, suggestions on topics that you would like to be covered in the group, uh, post them on the channel and uh, either Jamie or myself will follow. If you have ideas of speakers, that's even better. Um, and then the last one is I mentioned, there's a couple of people that indicated they are uh, new to the group. So let me just make sure that uh, we get all the presentations because we didn't do them at the start. So Nico's already presented himself. Janos as well. I don't know if you want to say something else about yourselves. Um, I don't know. 
I work at Red Hat. <laughs> Is that you important? Know, yeah, yeah, well, it's it's relevant. Uh, so if you oh. want to to show up for the meetings in the yeah, it's open to everyone. Uh, we have uh, we have Christina, uh, but she's not new. So who else is here? Remy. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm Remy Warren. I'm a Linux systems engineer at CERN Accelerator Controls. We have a physical infrastructure of uh, 400 servers, and the way we work with Ricardo on moving some workloads to Kubernetes. Um, so yeah, new here, and uh, hey everyone. Awesome, welcome. And I yes. think, I don't see the list, but I see Arne as well, who's probably doesn't have a mic either. Well, I can introduce him. He's down the corridor at CERN as well. And he actually runs the team that uh, takes care of Linux in the cloud here. And I think that's everyone. So, yeah. so. Anyone has any other business for today? Uh, let's see the chat. Let me just check. Awesome. Okay. If not, then we can reclaim five minutes. And uh, this has been great. Thanks a lot. And uh, see you all either at KubeCon or June 1st when we have our new session. Hopefully, there will be a lot of people at KubeCon. So looking forward. We can try to get like a small informal meetup of uh, research and user uh, group people. There will be a lot of talks in this subject. And there will be also the batch and HPC day on Tuesday before the conference. So I hope to see you there as well. And uh, yeah, talk soon. Thanks a lot. See you. Thanks, bye. All right. Bye, bye all. Bye.